Welcome to a very, very special edition of the Diverse and Inclusive Leaders podcast. Today, we are celebrating a momentous day, the 75th anniversary of VE or Victory in Europe Day. I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined by Commodore David Elford, OBE, ADC. Commodore David Elford is a highly effective senior executive and leader within the Royal Navy and has an extensive portfolio within program and project management with experience at board level across a broad and challenging spectrum of operational headquarters, acquisition, logistics, support infrastructure, training, engineering and change management roles within the Royal Navy, UK defense and also NATO positions. Commodore Alford joined the Royal Navy in 1981 and following initial training at Britannia's Royal Naval College, Dartmouth and at sea, he studied a BSc in Engineering Science at the University of Exeter and post-graduation in 1985, he studied aeronautical engineering, culminating in the award of a Certificate of Competency as a Royal Naval Air Engineering Officer in 1987. David, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much indeed. It's uh, nice to have such a, a nice introduction. It makes you think you're, you're, you're drowning. You, you're, your past is flushing before you. Bless you. Well, you've had an absolute, absolutely phenomenal career uh, and such dedication to the services. Uh, you know, I really do admire what you've achieved to date and I wonder before we we get into the nuts and bolts of, of talking about your background how you came to be where you are today whether we could just explore VE Day and its importance to yourself and of course the wider MOD and Royal Navy. Well certainly I'll try I mean you, you've you flattered me in the introduction of course but uh, you talk about achievements and so on but of course <laughs> Nothing that we do these days really uh, compares to to what, what people in wartime Britain had to endure and and the the, uh, the the achievements that they had to make in order to to overcome the, the tyranny that the world was facing at the time. And it's important today, of course, that we remember that. And there are still uh, happily some survivors, some people who lived through those terrible times and are still with us today. That, um, increasingly, we've over the years we've we've learned to respect them more and more, and to to mark their achievements and the sacrifices that they made during those wartime years. You know, the, the press has been has been full of admiration for the recently promoted Colonel Tom Moore, of course, as he as he uh, walked his little marathon in his, at his home and also raised huge sums of money for the NHS. So that's a great example, I think, um, but one of many, many, many that, uh, that, that we, we, we still happily still hear about and, and remember and commemorate. It was a fantastic story. Uh, when he walked his 100th lap, uh, I'm sure the amount of people who were tuning in to watch were, was absolutely astronomic. But um, as you say, so some really fantastic good news stories, given the current circumstances. And... You know, such strong reasons for us to remember the legacy of the past and, and what has gone before us. And I, I wonder in terms of obviously the, the, the parallels, as you mentioned there, between the end of World War II and, and World War II itself, those times are of kind of significant crisis. And now what we are facing in, in the invisible enemy that is COVID and the coming together almost of society, what can we learn from, from this wartime experience? When, whenever we as a society face challenges of national significance, whatever they may be, whether they be through war or, or other conflict, um, terrorism, or indeed this, this pandemic that we're, we're dealing with at the moment, it does show us the, the, the resi resilience that we have individually spread across the country, but also as a society. And we look towards our leaders in government and and elsewhere at these important times obviously we do and i think one of the things personally for me that has been quite encouraging is that uh, despite the constant shall we say the constant challenges uh, that the media seem to want to put up in front of our leaders 
and the the persistence in terms of seeking scapegoats and seeking to apportion blame most people that i talk to in society more generally recognize that we and this is an overused word for obvious reasons at the moment but most people in society recognize that we are living in unprecedented times and and it's actually far better to be constructive about about the way forward rather than seeking ways to be destructive and i think um there's been a bit of a backlash uh, against certain sectors of, of the media from society because we all collectively want to pull together and it's that wartime spirit pull together and overcome an enemy and in this case of course the enemy is the virus absolutely and you're absolutely right when you articulately say there let's be constructive not destructive there's so many so many issues and challenges in life uh, on a day-to-day -day basis let alone at a at a time right now but i think it really does put things into perspective and, and highlights the humanity that we must embrace in order to get through this and pull through this together yeah i think that um you know, it's very easy to, to pick up on, you know, couldn't you have done this better or, or don't you regret those mistakes or, or, or why didn't you do it that way? And that sort of thing. Hindsight is a fantastic thing. But people in leadership positions trying to navigate society in all its complexities through one of the most challenging times that we've had probably since the Second World War as an entire country. It's far better to look forward. I remember uh, a previous boss that, that I had in my career who actually wanted, used an expression that sort of lived with me and he said there's no point looking in the rear view mirror. We've got to look out the windscreen. We've got to look forward. And I think yes we learned lessons through experience and so that we don't repeat them and all the rest of it but but if, when you're dealing with a crisis it is it is futile to be wasting time and effort and resources thinking about how you might have done things better we're going forward, we need to devote those resources to tackling the crisis. I couldn't agree more. I absolutely could not agree more, David. And moving on, I wonder whether you might be able to talk to us a little bit about your, your journey, which of course I know is extensive and, and frankly we could, yeah. could speak about this all morning. But I wonder for those yeah. that are perhaps less familiar with, with the Navy and or even with the wider MOD, who would love to be able to get to know you a little bit better and some of the experiences that you've had, I wonder whether you could talk us through how you ended up coming to where you are today and, and a little bit yeah. about some of the, uh, I'm sure, what's been a, an emotional uh, journey up to, uh, up to this point. Uh, I'll try um, without boring the listeners. I, in my current role, which I'll explain a little later, I expect, I often am interested in, in why people make their career choices and particularly if I'm talking to to young sailors or, or I often um, will ask them why they join the Navy. Some of them have quite interesting reasons, some of them have quite amusing ones. One of my favourites that I remember hearing was when uh, this chap wanted to be an aircraft engineer which is my profession and perhaps understandably at the time thought that it was only the Royal Air Force that that operated military aircraft in our country and uh, so went to the RAF careers office to join but they were closed and next door the Navy was open so we walked in there and he ended up joining the Navy but um, in my own case I, I often just sort of relate my, my journey if you like because I literally cannot remember a time when I didn't want to join the Navy and that might sound a little bit corny but it's absolutely true and it's really only dawned on me in later life. Um, but what I, uh, I explain to people is the following. I was born in a naval hospital in Malta. My birth certificate is signed by a naval officer. Uh, my father was a chief petty officer, ordnance artificer. Um, I grew up in his hometown, Plymouth, which, as most of your listeners will know, is one of our main naval bases. And I have no idea why I joined the Navy perhaps it's obvious but but I I can't remember a time when I didn't want to join but I do actually recognize that there was probably a moment where I thought yeah this is what I want to do and it was when I was six years old my father took me on board an aircraft carrier he wasn't a very good sailor my dad he didn't he didn't uh, he couldn't deal with the motion of, of certainly smaller ships so we always used to 
try and get drafted to bigger ships. And he was a chief petty officer uh, helping to maintain the the uh, the lift systems, the weapon lift systems in this particular aircraft carrier, HMS Eagle. And the ship had a family's day. And being the son of a member of the ship's company, I had the great privilege of being able to go on board this aircraft carrier at sea in 1969. And it, at that time, when they, the fleet air arm was still operating as alongside helicopters, fixed wing aircraft, um, jets. Um, and of course, we're, we've started to do that again now with HMS Queen Elizabeth and the F-35 Lightning II. But there's been a huge uh, gap uh, between our, our loss of the Harrier and, and the Invincible class carrier and HMS Queen Elizabeth and HMS Prince of Wales. But back in 1969, I can remember being absolutely fascinated by watching large jet aircraft taking off and landing from this huge 45, I think, thousand ton aircraft carrier and thinking, that's what I want to get involved in. So from the age of six, that's what I want to do. And happily for me, it, it all worked out. Wonderful. And talk to us about the ranking system and how, because there's so many, and, I, and this is, you know, I'll share here with, with you and with all of our listeners, when I'm speaking with those from the, the, the military uh, and certainly, you know, with yourself in the Navy, I always worry about getting the titles correct, <laughs> because I know <laughs> in the military, this is something that's incredibly, incredibly important. And when I was reading up about your background, and I, I look at some of the things that you've done, you know, there, there are a lot of different chiefs, and, and, and of course, now mm. Commodore uh, as the title, um, being promoted to captain. In, uh, earlier as mm. well and working across the board as you alluded to previously actually some some individuals don't know that actually the navy encompasses aircraft it encompasses uh, helicopters mm. and, and and things mm. like that is not just uh, below the surface of the water talk to us a little about the the various different facets of, of the career and the different mm. positions served okay well i'll tackle that by saying that um the military, of course, is a very hierarchical rank-based structure, and you can divide it up in many different ways. And I'll talk in terms of the Navy, of course, but this applies equally to the Air Force and the Army. There is a rank structure for what we term ratings. People who are not officers are known as ratings in the Navy and officers. Now, I was very privileged. I mean, I almost certainly, given my background, would have joined joined the Navy as my father did as an artificer apprentice um, but because I did pretty well at my O levels which is the precursor to GCSEs my school persuaded me to stay on the do A levels and because of that I applied for a place at university and because I had offers I was able to join at the time as the, the, the scheme that was running at the time as a prospective engineer officer as an officer so unlike my dad who joined as a you know a, a boy apprentice at the age of 15 I joined as a midshipman uh, at the age of 18 straight from school and the Navy sent me off to university a year later to read for a degree I was very lucky in many ways there uh, but that's the way I joined so the ranks that I've held since I've been in the Navy and, and it's coming up to 39 years since I joined and it staggers me to think of that but it's true um, I've held all the officer ranks from midshipman to commodore. So uh, um, I have to have to apologise that I'm not an admiral. I didn't quite get to, to the rank of admiral, uh, but I've had all the ranks in between midshipman and commodore. My uh, father came up through as a rating and got to the rank of chief petty officer. And in those days, there was only one rank above that as a rating which is the warrant officer. And we still have warrant officers. And in fact, in those days, they were called fleet chiefs, but we changed them to warrant officers many, many years ago. And we still have them. Um, one of the other things I'll say, though, is all three services um, have schemes where people who are not officers, so in the Navy ratings, in the Army, they're known as other ranks, and in the RAF, they're known as airmen, they can be selected to become officers. Um, so they have to be really good as, as ratings and show real potential to take leadership and management experience positions in the future. Um, but they're selected and then specially trained to become officers. And two of my best friends in the world joined the Navy as with no qualifications whatsoever as sailors. In fact, they were both mechanics on, in the fleet air arm. 
one got to got to be promoted from chief to to sub lieutenant in the navy and in fact they both promoted from chief to sub lieutenant and then they went then went on one to the rank of commander but the the key thing about those stories they joined as they joined with literally no qualifications having had pretty difficult upbringings um, and in the way the navy sort of was a, was an escape from their circumstances they were selected to become officers and they, they were then very successful officers and they left one as a captain was a commander the point there that i often make and all three services are the same the navy is a real meritocracy it doesn't really matter who you are where you come from what matters is how good you are the attitude you take the op the opportunities you're prepared to take uh, and the navy will back you up and you know, I, I'm very proud of that fact, and it's still the case today, happily. That is just such a fantastic example of essentially upward social mobility. And you talk there yeah. about this being a metocracy, which I think is just, you know, it's fundamental to, to wider society and some serious lessons that I, I think the greater population can, can learn from from the military, ultimately. It's about that resilience and, and that hard work, that determination. Uh, that really does allow you to uh, to be promoted and to further your career. And on this point, I and again, you know, had opportunity to speak to uh, to, to many in the, the the Navy and the wider MOD, and it always strikes me as such a genuinely fantastic career possibility. And I, I wonder, from your perspective, how have things? You know, clearly. It was a fantastic opportunity then and still is a fantastic opportunity. I wonder how have things changed from then and now and, and why should the youth and indeed others who, who might be even wanting to get involved on a reservist perspective or, or, or from a, a voluntary point of view, why is it a great place to, uh, to, to join? I mean, there are a number of, of reasons or a number of ways of answering that question. Um, I think... Principally, as I've said, it's, it's about all three services being meritocracies um, and re genuinely not caring about your background. And certainly in the case of the Navy, it really doesn't. When I, when I first joined the, the Navy, um, I jo joined the Navy Officer Training Academy, which is known as Britannia Royal Naval College at Dartmouth. And I was, you know, with my background, coming from the West Country, from relatively humble stock, you know, I went to a state grammar school. I was slightly concerned that when I got to Dartmouth, I'd be surrounded by, you know, public school boys, principally, who were all, you know, bigger than me, stronger than me, fitter than me, cleverer than me. And actually, that wasn't the case at all. It really wasn't the case. In fact, those sort of individuals, you know, sort of um, more, you know, those days, more of a class-based society, um, those, those sort of individuals who were privileged genuinely privileged were very very much in the minority and they were the ones who for the first time felt that they were in a minority so which which i think was quite interesting but the navy is is genuinely a meritocracy as i've said it's also in, incredible for presenting you with opportunities be they opportunities for you know self-development career development sporting opportunities you know i effectively learned to ski while i've been in the navy and um in fact, the only sport that I ever really followed um, in, in all my career has been skiing. And the Navy's helped me to do that th throughout my career. And, you know, I, I think it's great when you go to the Royal Navy Ski Championships and you see the amount of effort that the Royal Naval w Winter Sports Association puts into taking people, genuine novices, people who have never even picked up a pair of skis in their entire lives, of whatever age they are, you know, being their young sailors who've only just joined all the way up to, you know, perhaps, you know, more older, more mature people who just never got around to it. And then saying, okay, well, we'll help, we'll teach you to ski. And uh, that, that's really great. So it's about opportunity. I think there's clearly there's the sort of camaraderie that, that goes with, goes with life, you know, from the day you join, mixing in with the, with the cadre of people that you, that fate has thrown together you know, going through the various uh, trials and tribulations of basic training together and learning that team spirit is, will, is what will get you through. Um, you learn those lessons in your basic training and then you, you benefit from that regularly throughout your career. So that team spirit is really important and it's 
it's it's driven into you and it's something that you will hold on to for your rest of your career that's really important and again all three services are the same that's absolutely fascinating and great to hear how many opportunities there that there, there were not only uh, when you first joined but also that there are now and i actually remember looking into for a time and again unfortunately time commitments prevailed but looking into being a reservist for for one of the areas of, of the forces be it uh, be it the navy uh, you know the raf or or, or the army uh, but it's amazing when you actually start to scratch below the surface that everyone is welcome whether you are from kind of business communities whether you have uh, had very very little experience as you've alluded to to earlier there are opportunities in lots of different shapes and sizes for those that come from a plethora of different backgrounds yeah that's quite right i mean i think the the mainstream um uh, service if you like has has perhaps learned from the reserves because i think you know by its very nature in our case the maritime reserves which which encompass the royal naval reserve and the royal marines reserve they have by their very nature very diverse groups of individual individuals in their membership and i think that the the, gen, the 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 general service if i can use that expression the rest of the navy if you like has learned that actually um diversity expands the talent pool and you've got a more if you've got a more diverse group of individuals in your in your pool in your force then actually you realize that that force can be more creative more innovative more ready willing and able to challenge the status quo and do things differently and try try alternative ways of doing things and and through experimentation realize that actually you don't necessarily you're not necessarily rigidly bound by custom and practice you know we learn that diverse groups make make better decisions um uh, and you know with less with less bias mostly unconscious bias um and less prone to to that expression group think um and so I think that's one of the changes I've seen in 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 my service career is that we it is definitely more diverse the Royal Navy and I think it's it's becoming uh, more diverse all the time I think one of the big changes is is really flexible working you know when I joined the Navy I effectively signed on for a 23 year career now if you said to me at age 18 you're definitely going to be in for 23 years I probably I probably wouldn't have believed that. I certainly wouldn't have believed that I'd still be here 39 years later. Where I did before. But, but do you know, I've never had a bad job. Um, I've learned that every job is what you make it normally and what the Navy is there to support you. But equally, you've got to go, go out there and grab it. You know, I think that uh, uh, the reason that I'm still wearing uniform after 39 years is because the Navy has genuinely... Um, been a a worthwhile provided me with a worthwhile and rewarding career and I use the term rewarding in, in every sense of the of the word you know we get relatively well paid uh, we certainly get looked after you know sort of pastorally if you like and medically and dentally and in terms of all the opportunities for for education and sport I mentioned so it, it is a family uh, and I think one of the things that I if you know, if I could would go back in time and, and had to give my younger self some advice, it would it would probably be to make sure you strike a balance. And this is where again the reservists and I didn't have I haven't really worked much with reservists um, in my career until recently. My current role sees me working more more with re the reserve community. But again, what we can learn from the reservists is that it's about striking a balance, and. I have huge admiration for the reserves because, you know, in my my professional career and my life, I've had to ba balance my family life with my professional career. What they've got to do is they've got to balance those two things with their reserve career as well. So they've got an extra dimension. 
so it's definitely important to strike the right balance some really valuable advice and, and lessons there which i think can be gleaned from our listeners and applied to uh, to to really any situation and what was really uh, really heartwarming to, to kind of hear is how genuinely passionate and enthusiastic you are after uh, you know what is ultimately a number of decades worth of service and um you know i'm conscious of time um, but if I, I i i am going to just ask a little bit about the international side if that's okay because mm. i think this will be something that is is not only fascinating to our listeners but also I, i'm dying to ask myself and i think very relevant given obviously the contribution of the commonwealth and today uh, as a whole to victory in europe including economic and material support from lots and lots of different countries such as Asia, Africa, Caribbean, etc. Just to name name a couple. But I wonder whether you could talk to us a little um, about some of the international sites. Of course, there's lots of international opportunities. I'd love to ask. I'm sure you've got many, many stories that 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 you could tell, or even most memorable moments during your career that you might be able to share in relation to to the international side, and also obviously why. Uh, why it is so important that, that we do recognize other countries and the involvement from lots of different areas on a day like this well um i suppose you can it's a huge subject really that you you can start on given what we're here to commemorate today you know we re very rarely as a country will do things in isolation you could argue we, we never really did we always collaborated um, with let's say ally or allies in in prosecuting our our business uh, around the world and the thing the thing about the royal navy of course is that that each warship is a is a little piece of sovereign territory it's a little piece or in case of hms queen elizabeth class it's you know it's four and a half acres of uh, of sovereign territory that you can take all over the world and fly our flag the nation's flag and diplomacy is is obviously vital to our country and the navy and its warships gives gives that diplomacy um a, a a key set of tools and i've seen that myself in my career and i had great good fortune to to serve in hms illustrious in in 1997 where the ship and a complement of of escorts you know including a submarine a couple of frigates a destroyer Royal Fleet Auxiliary support ships went all the way to uh, the Far East, to Japan, to Australia, and back again. All ports in between over the, over eight months, and it, it was just uh, you know as a whatever I was in my mid thirties, uh, serving in a helicopter squadron embarked in HMS Illustrious. You know, you talk about the international dimension. I think we visited something like eighteen different countries, and every time we went into a port there there was and and we still do this we have receptions and capability demonstrations where we effectively show off our uh, our ship our people um and our country all around the world um i can remember going into south korea and you know this is a lad from from plymouth in devon and uh, although i was born in malta you know we certainly didn't have foreign holidays when i was a kid and going to South Korea, being and getting on the uh, the public transport system and um, some sort of train, if I remember, and realizing that when I looked at the map inside the carriage of this train, I couldn't read any of the station names because the anglicised equivalent wasn't there. There was no anglicised equivalent. It was all in that particular script of whatever the whatever the name of the South Korean script is. I just knew I couldn't read it. And that brought it home to me. Wow, I I really am international now. I'm travelling, um, you know, uh, with the privilege of serving Her Majesty the Queen uh, to a foreign land where I can't even read the train map. Wow, that's uh, that's country got lots of lots and lots of images in my head here of the and uh, some some of the fantastic vessels as well. And I have seen a couple uh, at the various ports in my time, and it is that uh, I mean, there's really nothing quite like it, nothing quite like it. And I uh, I can imagine as you're speaking how exciting that that must have been. And uh, you're again to kind of reiterate for everyone who is listening in, whether it is that you are you're kind of senior within your career, whether it is that you're starting your journey in your career. 
there is just so much to see and so much to do. And I think, uh, you know, what do you encapsulate perfectly, David, if you don't mind me saying, is kind of the, uh, you know, the, the kind of the epic journey that, that, that you've been on, uh, you know, going to these foreign lands. It, uh, you know, I'm sure as a, a, a youngster, it was terribly, terribly exciting uh, to, to kind of explore. And, uh, you know, I think in particular, given, given obviously this very special day and the involvement and, and the capability that we now have to, to be able to speak to people from all around the world, that actually it is almost uh, you know now uh, you know it's a harnessing of, of the, the togetherness and, and the internationalism and, uh, and the fact that actually the world to a degree is a much much smaller place especially digitally speaking given that we are right now uh, you know talking to one another and not in the same place due to due to lockdown of course but uh, but some some really fascinating insight there thank you very much for sharing my pleasure and as a final point before we, we kind of summarise for today, I know that one of your personal proud moments is, is your family and, and your, your daughters, but I wonder whether you could share, uh, perhaps in terms of, of, of key achievements or, or things that have been particularly momentous for you in your career, both personally and also professionally. I've had a, um, a blessed uh, life. Um, I'm certainly blessed with, with three beautiful daughters who are all very, very successful in their own ways. Um, I've not managed to produce a single engineer or a single member of the armed for forces, by the way, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but that may that, that may be more due to my to my um, wife's influence. We have three wonderful daughters, um, but I owe them to really to my wife because a service career often means that you're you're not around, and she's had to be incredibly resilient. She hasn't had. A, a career in the same way that I have because she's devoted her life to bringing up our children and I will forever be grateful to her for that so they're the key, key achievements in terms of my career um, you know I'm, I'm proud of the fact that I was the Navy's chief aircraft engineer once, once upon a time in my career um, I'm proud of the fact that I ran um, the Defence College of Technical Training which is a is the largest technical military technical training institution in Western Europe, uh, which trains all three services, engineers and technicians. So I've worked a lot uh, with the Army and the RAF, particularly the Royal Air Force, given my background as a fleet air arm engineer, working with the Air Force has sort of gone with the territory. And uh, so I'm I'm proud. I'm proud that I ran that college. Um, I'm proud of what it achieved. I'm proud that it's uh, it's still thriving. And look, I know that we could go on uh, and yeah. talk for, for a much longer time, but uh, I, I think just in terms of a lot of the learnings today, I, I hope that you've enjoyed yourself. And I know that, that everyone at home uh, will, uh, will have enjoyed listening in today. I think from my, my side, uh, a lot of the learnings that, that I've taken away from this, and I think everyone can do. Uh, there's a lot that can be learned from, from those, that, of course, served our country. There's a lot that can be learned from the forces themselves and vice versa uh, with, uh, with the wider population and society, the, the amount of resilience and um, an effort uh, and sheer determination that is required uh, by those in the military is absolutely, is just something which, uh, you know, a huge, huge amount of respect should be paid. And from what you've said, I think going right the way back to, to our early uh, conversation today, uh, where you said that there's no point in looking in the rear view mirror. It's, uh, it's very much about looking forward. And it is, as you say, futile to waste time and effort and resource on, on things that uh, we, we, we can't change. And so actually, uh, you know, looking at that kind of that wartime spirit, that spirit of togetherness and really harnessing that and trying to remember those um, and those of the present day as well who are highly involved, those who are key workers, uh, you know, our health professionals, those in the military, everyone who is pulling together at this very, very important time, given the crisis and given fighting the invisible enemy, it is a real demonstration of humanity and how fantastic this great country uh, and the world is. And so thank you very, very much for sharing indeed. I think there's so many valuable lessons there to, to learn for all of our personal self-development. And I do hope as well that uh, this is really uh, struck a chord with those that have an interest further in actually finding out more about the services and, and indeed uh, indeed the Navy. So, so David, uh, thank you very, very much for sharing with us today your personal story and also the importance, of course, of the E-Day and it being the 75th anniversary. It's my great pleasure. Thank you very much for the opportunity and I wish you well. 
Thanks so much, David. My name is Leila Mackenzie Dellis, and you have been listening to this very special edition of the Diverse and Inclusive Leaders podcast, where we have been celebrating the 75th anniversary of Victory in Europe Day. We've been joined today by the absolutely remarkable Commodore David Elford. OBE. If you would like to find out any further information, I do hope you, you take a moment to visit the Royal Navy's website. We'll put all of the details there at the end of today's show into the show notes. Uh, so don't worry if you've not managed to take everything down. You can visit us at www.dalglobal.org forward slash podcast. And you can also check out our COVID-19 support hub, which is entirely free uh, given the circumstances of present. Thank you very, very much. And we will look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you so much for watching the Diverse and Inclusive Leaders podcast. Please do feel free to hit the like button below, or if you'd like to receive future notifications, do ping the notification bell here at the side. If you're interested in the audio version only, you can find it on the following streaming platforms. Any extra info and descriptions will be in the links below. Look forward to seeing you soon.